Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Sherry and I aren't with you there today. We are in El Paso, Texas today, having uh, some vacation time with her family down in South Texas. It's my privilege this morning to introduce our special guest speaker. Reverend Daniel Koblenz is an ordained minister, and he has been preaching since 1996. He and his wife, Diana, have been married for 25 years, and they live in Westport. Daniel and Diana have been a part of the CFA Church family for about three years now. Now, here's a few interesting facts about Daniel Koblenz. First of all, he was born and raised Amish. Also, he is a martial arts grandmaster, and he's got all kinds of different colored belts, including black belt in Taekwondo. He may have a bunch more, but that's what I was able to find out about him on Google. Uh, he also has been teaching martial arts for over 40 years. And six and a half years ago, Daniel had a heart transplant. Yes, that's our guest this morning. I am certain that you are going to enjoy and be challenged by his message. So would you warmly welcome to our platform, Reverend Daniel Koblenz, as he brings this morning's message. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. When Pastor Rick called, uh, oh, I don't know, a month ago and asked me to speak this morning, he said, um, you can share whatever's on your heart. You can share your testimony, whatever you feel like God's laying on your heart. Well, when you're speaking at your home church for the first time, I wanted to get a message together that was going to blow the doors off, you know? So I was like, okay, I'm not sure what I'm going to speak on. And about a week later, my wife, I told her that Pastor Rick had called, but I didn't tell him what he said, tell her what he said. About a week later, she said, what are you going to speak on at church? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And she goes, I think it'd be cool if you shared your testimony. Okay, Lord. Pastor Rick mentioned my testimony. My wife mentions my testimony. So today I'm going to share my testimony with you all. The title of my message is God is Faithful. And I asked Nathaniel to sing that song this morning. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so good. Because if you see anything through my story this morning, I want you to see the faithfulness of God. I want you to see how good he is to us. Even when we don't deserve it, he's good to us. And so that's one thing I want you to see. I have to tell you that, like Pastor Rick said, I was born Amish. And... Um, if you don't know what the Amish are, they have a picture coming up on the screen. I drove a horse and buggy to church when I was a kid. That's the way we went to church. If we went to town, we drove the horse and buggy. Um, if we went to see the neighbors or whatever, it was horse and buggy. We did all the uh, plowing, the disking, planting, harvesting. Everything was done with horses. And that's the way I was raised. It was normal for me. And I want you to kind of look at that picture, and you can see the, the wooden um, shaft that's called a shaft that's attached to the buggy, that pulls the buggy that's going alongside of the horse there. Um, that's significant because of what I'm going to be sharing with you after a bit about a little story that happened. I have so many stories that I could tell you guys, but we don't, you guys don't want to be here for two, year, two, two uh, hours, right? <clears throat> um, I was born in Northeast Ohio. We married to, or moved to Indiana when I was 12 years old. I grew up there at Rushville, around Milroy, at that Amish settlement there. That's where I grew up at. I have a sister that still lives there. Uh, the rest of my family lives in Kentucky. Most of them, I have one sister that lives in Ohio. Um, they're all still Amish. All of them that are, are living are still Amish. Um, I was baptized at the age of 16. And I wasn't baptized because of what happened here. I was baptized because that's what was expected from me. 
And we grew up in an old order Amish. And the old order Amish, there's different, um, different denominations, I guess, in the Amish people. And the old order Amish, most of those churches, if you are not baptized in the church, you cannot date. So what's a 16-year-old kid going to do? You're going to go get, get baptized, right? <clears throat> and so it wasn't what happened in here of why I got baptized, but because it was something that was expected of me, and naturally I wanted to date and so on. So um, growing up Amish, we, had, um, we, we learned Pennsylvania Dutch first. Pennsylvania Dutch is a mixture of English, German, and Swiss kind of entwined together, and that's what we grow, grew up speaking at home. As a matter of fact, when I talk to my dad or my sisters, at this point, we automatically, we just start talking Pennsylvania Dutch. And a lot of times when Diana's around, we try to convert over to English so she can understand what's going on. But Pennsylvania Dutch is what we learned to speak. Then we went to school, we were taught in English, and we were taught English. But the Bible that they read and the preaching was done in German. The problem with that is nobody ever really teaches you German. And I found out, since my wife's family, uh, her mom comes from Germany, I found out some of the things that we thought meant something in, in German didn't. For instance, the word mutze. A mutze in Amish is a suit coat. But in German, a mutze is actually a cap, like a toboggan. So it's something completely different than what we thought it was. So I didn't understand a lot of things that I read in the scripture. But I did learn some very important things. I learned to work hard. I learned to work with what we had. If we had a problem and something was broke down, you couldn't jump in the car and go to the store and get what you need and come back in 15 minutes and fix it. This was a major ordeal if you had to go to town to get something. It took you an hour to get the horse up, hitched up and by the time you got to town it was an hour wasted before you got there and, and then coming back. So you had to work with what you had. But I also learned some very important things of praying before our meals. Um, Every night, we would have a family prayer, night, prayer time before we went to bed. We had uh, times when we uh, studied the scripture. And, and, and the old order Amish people don't go to church every Sunday. They go to church every other Sunday. And the reason is, is because within a settlement of the Amish people, there is several different churches in there. And so they go to church every other Sunday. And the in-between Sunday gives them the opportunity to go visit another church, especially if there's a visiting preacher there or something. But sometimes you don't go to church on the in-between times. And in those times we would have Bible studies and we would um, uh, have prayer time and things like that with the family. So I learned some of those things. On a typical day, we would get up in the morning and go out and do the feeding and get the horses, maybe put the harnesses on the horses and get them ready to go. And, Mom and the girls would be fixing breakfast. We'd come in and breakfast would be laid out and we'd have breakfast. and We'd go out and hitch the horses up and get out in the fields and do what we needed to do. And about 11.30 or so, we'd come back in and put the horses in the barn, water and feed them, go in. Mom would have a meal laid out. We'd eat. And then we'd go back out and work in the field till evening and kind of repeat the process. And at the end of the day, when you got done doing all the chores, you were ready for bed. We didn't have a radio, we didn't have a TV, we didn't have any of that. You were ready for bed. And um, so we had different chores that we would do. One day we were, um, got done working in the fields and we'd come in and we'd put the horses in the barn and dad told me to start unharnessing the horses. And the stalls that we had in the horses were, we had two by twelves that went between the horses and they came down at a certain angle and they were put and they were fastened on the back and fastened in the front because one horse would be in this stall another horse would be in this stall 
And with that 2 by 12 in between them, it was at just the right angle and the right height that when they kicked, they most of the time would kick that 2 by 12 instead of kicking each other. And when we went in to unharness the horses, um, we would go up to the horse and we'd walk up behind them and pat them on the rump and say, whoa. And they knew what was going on and they would get over. And you just walk in there and take the harness off, take it behind them and hang them up. And we had one horse that was a perchin. And I believe there's a picture of a perchin horse. Um, kind of show you the size of this horse, okay? This, this, this horse, this perchin that we had, his name was Jerry. He weighed close to a ton. And I was unharnessing horses one night, and the horse right beside him, his name was Barney. And I'd walked up behind Barney, and I patted him on the rump, and I said, whoa, and get over, Barney. And I patted him, and he kicked me. And he kicked me right in the stomach. And it knocked me over, and I fell sideways. And my neck hit that 2 by 12 that was between him and Jerry. And when all that commotion started, Jerry, just out of instinct, boom, kicked. When he kicked, the hair on his leg brushed my face. As it brushed in and back, it brushed my face. It was that close. Had he kicked a fraction of an instant later, or a fraction higher, I wouldn't be here before you now today. But God is faithful. He's always faithful in every situation. There was another time when I had a, I had a horse that we got off the racetrack, and her name was Elsie, and she was kind of she was kind of rowdy. But I was a young guy, and I wanted a rowdy horse because I wanted a fast horse. Because just like you guys, we like fast cars. We like fast horses, you know. We would race them down the road, you know. And um, Elsie was kind of pretty spirited. And when we came home on this particular uh, way from the north that we came, there was a Flat Rock River ran through there, and there was an iron bridge that went across. And whenever you went across that bridge, that thing would rattle, and it would get the horses excited. And after we crossed the bridge, we had neighbors, that our closest neighbors lived right there on the left, and they had dogs that would come out and bark at the horses. And there was a crossroads and a straight that led up to our house. It was a flat that kind of went up on a grade. And when we came home, when we go, went across that crossroads, we would kind of let the horses run because they knew they were going home, and we kind of let it run, and, run it out a little bit, you know. This particular day, I come across this bridge, and my horse was already excited. And she hit that bridge, and that thing rattled, and she got more excited. And the dogs come out, the neighbor's dogs come out and started barking at her. And I had both reins, both reins wrapped around my hands, my, both my feet up on a dash, and I was laid into that horse trying to hold it back. And mom was coming down on the crossroads in another buggy with a horse. And she seen my horse going crazy, so she stopped. And right as I was going past mom, boom! Something busted, and I slammed back into the seat, and the bit in my horse's mouth broke in half, and the reins I had did nothing, and that horse took off down the road just as hard as she could go, and I'm in that buggy. I looked out. I was going to jump out, but I was going so fast that at the least it would have broke my legs, so I crawled out the front, door, front of the buggy out the storm front of the buggy, onto those shafts like I was showing you on that, onto those two-inch wooden shafts. I crawled out on that, jumped up on the horse's back, and I had a little wire bit in her mouth that was a neck rein to keep her head up. I reached down there, and I grabbed a hold of her bridle, and I slowed her down, and I got her stopped. And I got off, and I had a hold of her. And Mom was coming up behind me. And she stopped and picked my hat up because my hat went flying up over top of the buggy. And my mom was bawling. I had a hold of this horse. And I was like, whoa, here. You know, I was hanging on to her, you know. And I really hadn't thought about what I'd done until mom came up there. Because she just knew I was going to be dead. Crawling out. She knew I was crawling out on top of that horse. But God is faithful. 
and he kept his hand over me, over many situations like that. When I was 20 years old, I left home, and um, even when I left home, I still had some things that I learned at, at when I was younger. And Proverbs 22, 6, there's a slide with this verse, if you would put that up, please. There's a slide that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Some of you all need to hear that. Teach your children when they're young, because when you think it's not getting into them, it's still getting into them. And even after I left the Amish, and I was not a Christian, I was a believer but I was not a Christian. But even after I left, I would go to church every once in a while. And I would still believe. And believe it or not, I still prayed sometimes. I was a believer, but I was not a Christian. And I believe that there is a lot of people in this world today that are the same way. They believe, but they've never made that conversion over to a Christian. Today, if you're here like that, you're going to get the opportunity to fix that. After I left the Amish, I started training in martial arts. And when I started training in martial arts, I remember I prayed and I said, Lord, if I could just make it to a brown belt, I would be happy. I would be content if I could make it to a brown belt. I stand before you today a world certified from the headquarters in Korea, world certified, eighth degree black belt, senior grandmaster. It only goes to nine degrees. That's as high as it goes. And the Lord willing, in 2023, I'm going to get to go, probably have to go to Korea and test for my ninth degree black belt, which is as high as it gets. Little did I know what God had in store. Little did I know God's faithfulness. My wife is a world certified seventh degree grandmaster. We have schools scattered throughout Indiana and even into the surrounding states. We had no idea what God had in store. But Second Timothy 3, 14 and 15 says this, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Please remember something. At that time, I was a believer. I knew God was real. I believed the Bible was real. But I was not a Christian. I hadn't made that conversion yet. And one night I was laying in bed. My wife was asleep. And God kept putting his thumb on me. Because I knew he had a calling. And he kept putting his thumb on me. And I laid in bed that night. And I said, Lord, I'm done. I'm done running. I give up right now. I'm going to quit trying to do things my way, and I'm going to quit running, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. And I gave my life over to the Lord that night. And everything changed from there on. The next week, I got a phone call from Indianapolis. There was a death convention in Indy, and they wanted me to come up and do a demonstration, a martial arts demonstration. To this day, I don't know how they got my phone number. But I said, okay, I'll come up and do it, but there's going to be preaching involved. And they said, that's okay. That was the first time I went and done a martial arts demonstration and preached the gospel at the same time. Since then, my wife and I developed a team we call God's SWAT team. SWAT stands for serving with a twist. The twist is that we go into places, we'll go into churches, prisons, military bases, 
street festivals, schools, basically wherever they let us. We'll go in there and we'll yell and scream and bust boards and throw each other around and we'll preach the gospel at the same time. We've had the opportunity of being in some awesome places. We were in a church in Florida one day out on the stage doing a martial arts demonstration and preaching the gospel. The church was so big you could put a 747 jet into the auditorium and the wings would not touch on the sides. I've been over in Korea on the stages over in Korea. They would take us into the building at 10 o'clock at night and they led us into the building and we'd do a demonstration and preach the gospel and when we got done they took us out the back door, rushed us out in the bus and got us out of there because they said you won't get out of here. Them people are going to thong you. Or they're just going to be all over you and you're not going to get away from here. You need to get out of here. There was over 4,000 people there at 10 o'clock at night for a church service. We've been to some awesome places. We've been on the stage at West Point Military Academy up in front of the majors and the generals kicking each other around, throwing each other around, telling them about the love of Jesus. We've seen some really cool stuff. We were in a, we've been in several different prisons, all kinds of prisons. Pendleton is one of them. We've been in Pendleton. There was one time we were in a prison in um, Kentucky, and there was two prisons there. There was a maximum security prison on one side and a medium security prison on the other side. In between, they had these big fence wires with the uh, razor wire on top, you know, and they called that the dog track in between the two prisons. They set us up right there, and we went ahead and started doing our um, demonstration, and when we gave the altar call that day, there was over 200 men that came up to the fences to give their heart to the Lord. It was so powerful, but it was God. And as I went through there and I went down one side and the other and I prayed with people, there was one old man that stuck out to me. He was an old man, gray-headed. And when I came up to him, he stuck his finger through the fence so that I could hold his finger while I prayed with him. And he was broken, sobbing. It's nothing that I could do. That's nothing that anybody can do. It is only the Holy Spirit of God that can do that. And for an old person to give their heart to the Lord that way, it is that's so powerful because an older person is really established in their ways. But we've seen some awesome things. We have literally seen thousands of people come forward at an altar call at one time. But it's all because of God. It's all because of what he does. In 20, 2003, we were in Knoxville, Tennessee. We had taken a team of, team of students down there to a national championship for martial arts championship. It was the first time I'd ever taken a, a team to the nationals. And they had won gold medals. Some of them won silver and bronze medals. And that evening we were out um, celebrating. We were out eating and we were in a restaurant. It was hot, but it, I had on shorts and a t-shirt, air conditioned. We're sitting there at the table eating and I told Diana, I said, I'm not feeling very good. She said, are you all right? I said, well, I think so. And I just kept getting worse. I was like, man, I'm just not feeling good. She said, you gonna be okay? I said, I don't know. I put my elbow on the table, put my head in my hand like this and I was sweating really bad. I was sweating so bad that the sweat was dripping off my arm as I sat at the table. We had a registered nurse with us. Her granddaughter took classes from me and she said, he's going into cardiac arrest. The kids started crying, parents were crying because they were watching me die. And I sat there and I remember I prayed and I said, Lord, I didn't think I would go now, and I don't think I would go this way, but if it's my time, it's okay. I'm ready. But if not, I ask that you would take this away from me. 
And within seconds, that stuff started going away, and I started drying up. I was like, I'm okay. And they said, you're going to the hospital. And I said, no, I'm okay. No, you're going to the hospital. No, I'm fine. Well, I went to the hospital. <laughs> and I was in there for two weeks, and they'd done tests. They found out that I had a heart disease that I was born with called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And basically what it is is the walls within my heart were so thick that my heart couldn't squeeze the blood out and suck it back in like it's supposed to. And it was a disease I was born with. And to come to find out what happened to me there at that table, that little incident, my heart had went out of rhythm. And somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when that happens, 95% of the people fall over dead like that. And there's no saving them. I was in that 5%. God is faithful. God is faithful. He wasn't done with me. I've had five different defibrillators and pacemakers put in me. Um, and my heart kept getting worse. It kept getting worse and things kept happening. In 2014, early 2014, actually late 2013, I wasn't feeling well. Early 2014, we were going to the heart specialist. What's going on? What's happening? Well, you need to go check, get checked by your doctor. So we went to the doctor, and they checked me for all kinds of different things. And we had one last thing we were supposed to be checked for, and that was my gallbladder. We went into the doctor's office, and she sat down there, and she opened up her, her laptop, and she got on there and looked at it. And she looked over at me, and she said, Mr. Koblenz, we can't find anything wrong with you except your heart. And Diana started crying because that was the last thing that we had. So the next day, she called my heart specialist, and she told him something has to be done. And he said, can you meet us in Franklin Friday? This was like a Wednesday. And two days later, we're going to a heart specialist. That doesn't happen, right? So we said, yeah, we can meet you. So we went to Franklin, met him up there. And he said two things that we'd never heard him say before. Congestive heart failure and a heart transplant. So it was the point to where I had to have a heart transplant. I remember <clears throat> us trying to deal with it in our minds because we knew the severity of what this meant. They were going to cut me open, take my heart out, and put a different heart in me. People die during that stage a lot, all the time, and we knew that. I remember us sitting at home in the living room. Diane and I were sitting there broken. and We had a CD player on, and we had Ray Bolts on. And it was singing, The Anchor Holds. In spite of the storm, the anchor holds. Though the ship's been battered, the anchor holds. We ha held on to that anchor of Christ because that's all we had. That's the only hope we had was his goodness and his faithfulness for us. <clears throat> We had to tell my kids, grandkids, it wasn't easy. Grandpa's got to have a heart transplant. Ooh, that's not easy. They started doing testing on me for different things, and the first day that I went to the hospital up there, they took 48 vials of blood out of me. 48 of those tubes, okay? They took blood out of this arm till they couldn't hardly get any more, and they switched over here and finished it up. They took that much blood testing me for everything. I was tested for anything you could possibly imagine. They put a, a pick line in my arm that went all the way into my heart, and I had a little purse type of thing that I carried here, and it had a pump in it and medicine, and it was running 24 hours a day pumping medicine directly into my heart, keeping my heart going. We had checked, they checked me for everything, and the last thing they checked me for was my liver. 
And uh, we were in the, up there, sit, I was sitting on the bed, and Diana was sitting there, and Dr. Pitts came in, and he said, I have some bad news. He said, it looks like you're in the early stages of cirrhosis of the liver, and we won't give you a heart transplant. What? We went from, man, I have to have a heart transplant to, I can't have a heart transplant. And he said, what happened is, is this medicine I was taking called amiodarone had attacked my liver. And I've been taking it for the last eight years to help my heart pace and keep going. And it attacked my liver. And I said, well, can I just get off of that medicine for a while and get it out of my system and check it again? He said, well, we can do that. But once that medicine's in your system, it's in there. And I said, well, we'd like to try to do that. So they took us off of the medicine. I think it was two weeks. Um, we went home, not knowing exactly what was going to happen here. And the numbers, when they checked my numbers, there was one number that was 10. And normal, there's two numbers that they check when they check your liver like that. The normal numbers are 8. That's normal. One of my numbers was at 10, and the other one was at 25. And they said... The 10 would have been okay if this 25 would have been at 15 within five points, we'd have still been okay. So we went home thinking that we may not be able to have a heart transplant. And while I was at home, my, my daughter Amber called me one day. And she said, Dad, I was reading my Bible and this verse, I read this verse and I think it's for you. It's found in Ezekiel. 36, 26, and I think there's a slide for that. But it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And the doctors had basically told us that my heart was too hard is why it wouldn't work right. And she told, gave me this Bible verse. And I said, Amber, you, you have no idea what you're telling me. But I'm taking that. And we're hanging on to that. We went back up after two weeks and they tested me again. They got me all prepped and everything and I was laying on the bed. Just Diana and I were in the room. And she came over to me and she laid her hands on my body. And I laid my hands on my body and we prayed over this body. That God would do something in this body. And we went in, and we had tests done, and we came out, back out, and they said, your numbers are 8 and 8, perfectly lined up. God is faithful. The transplant was back on. In um, December 11th of 2014, they took me in and made me in the hospital. They put a swan in my neck right here, curled out out here like this. There's medicine pumping in. They said, Mr. Koblitz, you won't leave here without a heart transplant. Up to that point, I believed that God was going to heal me. And one of these days, I'll talk to you guys about that maybe. But I don't have time this morning to get into all that. Um, on December the 19th, while I was in the hospital waiting on a heart, my brother David, who lived in Colorado, had also left the Amish, had the same disease I did, needed a heart transplant, but he was a smoker and a drinker. And if you're a drinker or a smoker or a tobacco user, you will not get a heart. There's too many people that are healthy that need a heart, and those hearts are so rare, they're not going to give it to people that are not taking care of themselves. So on December the 19th, he passed away while I was in the hospital waiting on a heart. I asked the doctors if I could leave to go to the funeral. They said, well, we can't keep you here, but if you leave, the chances of you going back through all that testing and getting back here to this spot and making it that long is slim to none. So we made the decision that I was not going to leave the hospital. On December the 23rd at 2 o'clock in the morning, they came in the hospital and they woke me up in the bedroom. And they said, Mr. Koblenz, we have a heart for you. I remember I was a nervous wreck. 
I remember calling Diana. I remember them prepping me, get, kind of getting ready for it, but I don't remember a whole lot of that. Um, the surgery went real well. They came out. The doctor came out told my wife that night when I was out of surgery that everything went well. He'll be home by New Year's Day. And on December the 25th, two days later, everything went bad. I started quitting producing love, uh, blood platelets, and I was bleeding just out of every hole in my body. I was just bleeding everywhere. My lungs collapsed. Um, my kidneys quit, work, quit working. They had to put me on dialysis. It was dark times, folks. My dad walked out of my hospital room and told my sisters, he's not going to be here by this weekend. The doctors told us when we left, they said, Mr. Coleman, there was times when there was nothing we could do. We just went back to the back and prayed for you. Because it was that bad. It was at the point where the doctors had given up. While that was going on, I was in an induced coma for about six weeks. And my wife, and I'm not going to look at her now because if I do, I'll start crying. But my wife would come in there every day and get over my bed and quote scripture over me and telling me I'm an overcomer. I'm going to get through this. God is on my side. She would play Christian music for me to hear while I was in a coma. When I couldn't fight the battle, my wife was fighting the battle for me. I was literally out of it, guys. I seen things that I don't know why I seen them. I was in a place that I'm not sure if it was heaven or what it was, but it reminded me of Switzerland. The houses were just huge, big, huge, massive, beautiful houses. The country was beautiful. And my mom had passed away in 2009. This was uh, five years before this. And there was, I, I was coming through this tunnel, and there was this big, beautiful lake laying out here and green plush grass that came down to the lake and I was coming out of this tunnel and my mom and my brother who had just passed away were standing down there beside the lake waiting on me smiling I never got down there to talk to them because see God's not done yet God was not done with me yet my work's not done I was at a place, that I went into a building while I was there that I thought the Amish Ordnung was established. And when I walked in, the scripture were wrote all over the walls in there, and there was benches in there, and they had church services. And there was old people sitting there that, when I was six years old, these guys were old people then in church. And they were sitting in there, and I talked to some of them. After I was out of the hospital, I was at home. My brother-in-law was at, sitting there at my table. And my sister was there. And my dad was there. I was telling them that story. And my brother-in-law goes, you're kidding me. And I said, no. He said, when your sister and I were in Switzerland, we went to the place where the Amish Ordnung was established. The scriptures wrote all over the wall in German. The benches are set up in there. They have church services in there. Why I seen that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know why, but it was there. God is faithful. I was discharged from the hospital on February the 19th. I had to relearn how to walk. I laid in that coma for six weeks. My muscles had deteriorated. When I came home, my wife and her dad had to help me up the stairs of the steps to get up into the house because my legs were so weak. For three weeks, I still walked around with a cane. But the fact that I can do what I do now with no problems, that's God. That's God. That's God's faithfulness. And you know what, guys? I have had zero rejection. I've had no heart rejection. People that have heart transplants almost all the time deal with rejection. I've had zero I've had a few little complications, very minor stuff. But you see, when God does things, he does them right. And he does them the right way. 
I had been back. They had, they had me come up to the hospital and talk to people that were getting ready for transplants. And I would go in there and talk to the people and pray with them. They had me come in and speak to a bunch of people that some of them had just had transplants. Some of them were still waiting on heart transplants. And I got to go up there and share my story with them and tell them how God brought me through this. God is faithful all the time. They say that after one year, 90% of the people are still alive that have a heart transplant. And after 12 to 13 years, 50% are still alive. That said, my heart doctor said, I also have patients that have been 30 years plus after a heart transplant, and they're still going. And I believe that's going to be me. I believe that's going to be me until God gets done with me of what, I, what, what he wants me to do. And you know, I tell you all this story and I, everything, but there might be somebody here today or there might be somebody watching online. Maybe you are a believer, but you're not a Christian. You've never made that conversion. It's easy to do. It's easy for us to go to church regularly and, and do what appear to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. But we have to make that conversion to being a Christian. And when God gets a hold of you and you look back and you see your life and if you see anything in this story that I told you all, I hope you guys see God's faithfulness in this and how that he was there all the time for me, even when I didn't deserve it. So as the team comes forward this morning, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about making that conversion. And the Bible tells us in Romans, that there's, a, there's a slide for the Romans chapter 10, and it says in verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to stop there for a minute, and I'm going to talk to you about that word confess. Because what that word confess means, you have to, excuse me, first speak it out of your mouth. You can't just think it. You have to speak it. There is power in the spoken word. The Bible says when God created the, the great, created light, he said, let there be light. He said, let there be light. He didn't think, let there be light. He said, let there be light, and there was light. There is power in that spoken word. So the first thing is we have to speak that out of our mouth, that we're making Jesus the Lord of our life. And if we do that, if we confess that, then what happens is you're going to live it. You're not just going to be a believer, but you're going to be a Christian. You're not going to be just someone that knows and believes in the truth, but you're going to display it in your life. That's what that confession means. It's more than just saying it, but it does start with saying it. And it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it says, for with the heart, by the way, I got a 20-year-old heart. When I got my heart transplanted, I got a 20-year-old heart. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me, remember, I'm 50. <laughs> but if, 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 for it's with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And verse 11 says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, if you're male or female. There's no distinction to God. There's no difference. For the same Lord over all is rich on all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is whoever? It's anybody. Folks, that's Charles Manson. If he called on the name of the Lord and gave his heart to the Lord like this, he would be saved. You haven't done anything bad enough that God will not save you. All you have to do 
is make that conversion from being a believer to a Christian. So what I want you to do this morning, and online, if you're watching the online, I want you to speak this out. I'm going to lead you all in a prayer. And I want everybody within the sound of my voice to repeat this prayer after me. And if you're at home, you do the same thing out of faith. You, st you speak it out. You speak it out in your living room or where you're sitting. You confess that out of your mouth, what we're about to say. Bow your heads and say this. Dear Lord God, come on, speak it out like you mean it. Dear Lord God, I come to you this morning, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me whiter than snow. Dear Lord God, I am confessing with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And I believe I am saved. Dear Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, teach me to be the Christian you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for what he just did. That's awesome. You know the Bible says that if one person, if one person, the Bible says if one person said that prayer and really meant it and made that conversion, the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. Isn't that awesome? There's the... You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.